Lily Smith joins us today um, from Massachusetts. She's with Autodesk, and she's actually giving a presentation called Generative Design in Revit. Very broad and very interested in hearing more about that. How are you today, Lily? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for I, joining us. Yeah. I'm from DC. How, how is my definition? Oh, you're from DC. I'm virtually going home a little bit. But. There you go. Absolutely. I love it. Well, welcome home. <laughs> so I would love to hear how did, how was my definition probably way too broad of just so, yeah so my talk is uh so I'm a product manager at Autodesk responsible for the generative design and Revit tools so my talk is really a product briefing and so going over what people are using it for I have three uh use cases of customers using generative design and Revit uh, and then um, talk about what we're working on and what's on our roadmap for next. And I also have, I love your polls here, and I have a poll in my presentation at the end where I really want to get everybody's feedback uh, on our roadmap. So I would love for you all to come. If you, if you, um, if you can't come or want to, uh, just do the poll. You can do that too. Um, one note on AU this year. So obviously, if you've been to AU before, you know that we have a long history of you know having it in person at Vegas. It's never been virtual before. This is our first year virtu virtual. There are, last I looked, over 75,000 people registered for this event. So they're really trying to make this so that a lot of people can attend. And uh, a lot of the formats of the talks are that they're recorded. So you can watch them when you want, depending on what time zone you're in. You can watch them at two times. You can um, you know, stop and take care of your dog or your kid. Um, so know that. Uh, and but we also are having some live Q&A sessions. And I think, so Sophia, you have a class, right? And do you have a live Q&A session too? No, no, it's not a live Q&A. It's on the, the page, basically. And then the lab um, that Alex just talked about, that's live, right? Um, we pre-recorded that lab and we're doing a live Q&A session. Okay, cool. So that lab will be great because then you can, if you get confused, you can stop. And also it sounds, Alex, like so much fun. I'm going to do that lab myself. <laughs> um, uh, so if you want to meet the team at Autodesk that makes generative design, you can come on Thursday at five o'clock Eastern. We are going to have the whole team there answering questions about the product briefing. So um, we'd love it if you guys want to show up for that. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see everybody. It's just going to be like our faces on whatever platform they have. And then you write in your questions. Um, but we really hope that people will come and we can have uh, still have a good discussion that way. I guess with 75,000 people, that's kind of how you have to do it. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that um, if you've been to AU in the past, uh, the Dynamo team, which I work with at, at Autodesk in Boston, um, we often have a party and we've called it Dyna Noche, Dyna Night. This year we're calling it Dyna Zoom. <laughs> and I don't know how much of a party it's going to be. It's at, I think it's at um, Thursday at 1.30 p.m. <laughs> But um, we're hoping to have it be where we have a lot of um, computational design people get together and then have small breakout rooms where people can talk and just have it be very informal, but a way to connect with people in this huge audience of 75,000 people. So um, look for those things and would love to be able to connect with you all in this virtual world because I'm going to very much miss people seeing people in real life, but um, hopefully we can make it work at AU next week. Uh, with yeah, our that's definitely the saddest thing about the conferences going virtual, right? Is you miss all the connections that you make and the new the new you know networking opportunities and all of those things. But that sounds awesome. I'm definitely going to have to look out for this Dyna Zoom. 
because I always love those events. They're always such a great time. So I'm sure you guys will find a way to make it really fun, <laughs> even virtually. <laughs> Awesome. Well, next up, we have Raquel Buffscones, and she's coming from us from Barcelona. So not only do we have people from Sweden today, we have some people from Spain today. So that's awesome. She is actually presenting. She's with Autodesk as well uh, in Spain, as I mentioned. And she's actually presenting generative design. Find her presentation <laughs> name here as I misplaced it. It is the non-geek's guide to optimizing daily workflows with generative design. So I know that's definitely something that I've been pushing to my computation team at Smith Group. Very, very excited about that one. How are you doing today, Raquel? Hi, good evening from Barcelona. Thank you for having me. And um, yes, it's a really long name, <laughs> really long, no, uh, really long title for a class. I'm presenting with my colleague, Paolo Serra. And we wanted to showcase how everybody can use generative design. So it's not only for people doing really cool stuff like Sophia and Eric, but it's, it's something that could be for everybody. Okay, so we are presenting six uh, examples that are ready to use. So we are sharing our scripts and you can download and use them um, right away. And we are showing how with little knowledge of Dynamo, you can do many things. You don't need to know Python. You don't need to know uh, any other programming language to start working with generative design and taking its uh, advantage. Uh, Paolo and I, we are consultants at Autodesk. We work in with EMEA uh, customers, and we have been working with generative design for quite a long time. So we are also sharing some tips and tricks um, after working with many customers. Uh, so we are really excited. We, we, put a lot of effort in this class. It's been a bit of a stress. I am sure that the rest of the speakers are uh, thinking the same because we were asked to put the recordings together like quite early in mid-October and all the materials and it's been a race. But I'm really excited because next week, uh, Thursday, we are having this uh, live Q&A. Uh, so I really encourage you to, to watch the recording and then join it. Maybe it's too early for you because I think it's like midday my time, in your time. So quite early in the morning for you, maybe. But I think the Q&A will be recorded as well um, in case you cannot join. Yeah, I think awesome. the Q&As are going to be available for 30 days. Is that right? After? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And also, so the the pages for the classes are already uh, live. So you can go and um, bookmark the classes that you want to, to attend. And you can start interacting with the speakers by uh, typing comments. And we will be uh, answering them. Awesome. Can you give us an example of maybe just a few of those six generative design examples you're going to go uh, over? Or should we have to go. We have to go to the <laughs> You have to go, but I, <laughs> I can give uh, just a hint. So one of my favorite ones is um, uh, toilet design. So we, we have a, a room in Revit and we look at uh, options to set up all the elements, uh, you know, toilet, the sink, the bathroom, uh, the bath, sorry, the bathtub, and how to combine them and how to place them. And uh, we are optimizing things like, of course, we don't want them to class. Uh, we want to have like the uh, use area to actually use <laughs> the element. So things that uh, like many architects they are using. And um, other of the other example is um, how to set up uh, scope boxes. So for some for big. Uh, project or master planning, how to optimize the location of the scope boxes. So uh, I'm sure that if you have worked in really big project as I am, I have in, in master planning, sometimes you have like mm, seats where you have only a corner <laughs> of, uh, of the project and it's really annoying having to, to have an extra seat for that. So we, uh, uh, we developed this, uh, this workflow to optimize that. That's what I know that as someone who has had to create those match lines and scope boxes and figure out how best to optimize that on the sheet, that would be so helpful. I feel like I've spent days just figuring out how best to fit something on a sheet. So that's such a wonderful practical example. Can yeah, you give us any other maybe examples that you see as, uh, you know, someone who's going and seeing some, some firms and seeing what people are doing in generative design, maybe some common things that you see people doing within the industry with generative design? 
Uh, so the thing is, when working with our customers, usually they go for uh, like really complex uh, <laughs> um, workflows, like, okay, I want a whole station <laughs> to be built, and, and we work in this kind of project. So that's why Paolo and I discuss, hey, let's do something for everybody, okay? Let's, mm -hmm. let's show a case how this tool is for everybody. Like, even if you are doing like really like small projects, like housing or it's, it, you can use it, you can utilize it for normal or um, like regular uh, task. Right, absolutely. And I love to see even the high scale of something like Sophia and Eric, what they're presenting of, you know, just this in elaborate site, like master plan. But Sophia, Eric, do you guys get down into the nitty gritty in terms of even some of those parts and pieces of the, the homes and single family homes and things like that, the toilet rooms, the kitchens that you're optimizing? No, not really, because that's the thing. We have already predefined the whole house. So the toilet is where it is, basically. Um, so everything is predefined. So what we shuffle on the side is basically the shell. And then we know the reference points for all of the other elements inside that volume. And so essentially within Revit, it's just placing a kit of parts, right? Exactly. Those exactly. Kit of parts that you guys have already predefined as workable exactly. components, if you yeah. will. Exactly. I would love to get into your Revit model and see what those components are. <laughs> like, are they, are they families yeah, in themselves? Yeah, I'm just responsible for that, so, yeah. <laughs> but I actually, I think we'll add to that as well. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Eric. So it, in, our, in our AU presentation, we also talked a little bit about our generative design for multifamily housing. And there we actually go more into like the, the actual parts themselves and not only like the, the master plan, the more detail level. But uh, that's for the AU presentation. Well, and I guess yeah. to both of you, you know, optimizing and giving the, the designer more, you know, res you know, just basically an, a better idea of what the possibilities are. I mean, it seems like it could be endless. Do you guys cap that at all? Is there, you know, certain criteria of matching your parameters that you look at to, to narrow down that scope? You know, what are some of those? And I, once again, if this is like, Danny, you have to come to our presentation to see all of that, please just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually discussed that earlier today and we don't have a defined answer to the question because if you have a really small site, you, you don't end up with that many different alternatives. But if you have a super big site, then it's quite hard to evaluate the different alternatives. So one question that we're going to dis discuss with our design team tomorrow is like the, the sizes of the scales and what's relevant for applying generative design on neighborhood development. Uh, so some scales are too small. Of course, you get a lot of different alternatives, but they are very similar to each other. And it doesn't make such a big difference to apply it. But if you have a too, a too big scale, then it's also quite hard to get an understanding of what the difference actually is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we, we, are, we are actually elaborating mm -hmm. with that question at the moment. Right. How do you even define that criteria and make it so that it, you know, you can define that criteria regardless of the project, right? Because that's just probably a lot of the time with not only generative design, but computation. How yeah. can we apply a you know workflow to mm -hmm. many different processes or projects, right? Yeah, I would say that I think the hard like one of the hardest parts of generative design is actually find a good balance between what you want to allow and what you want to. So you want to find a big design space, right, and evaluate a big design space to be able to get a lot of different uh, alternatives. But at the same time, you want all the alternatives that you generate to be relevant, right? Uh, you don't want to generate alternatives that you wouldn't choose anyway, right? So find a good balance between what you should allow and what you should maybe not allow in your scripts. I think that's, that's something that we're working a lot with and together with the designers and the architects. One thing we came across too in the work we are doing is that you have to be careful, I guess, of competing um, kind of goals as well because you can be pushing one way for one reason and pushing the other way. So you kind of end up in the middle. And so sometimes um, we found it useful to work towards one goal in one scenario, but kind of break down the optimization into kind of almost phases or different parts. 
Absolutely. And almost just to kind of you as yourself as the designer to be able to understand what those priorities are in terms of the parameters that you're setting and the data that you're collecting, right, Alexandra, based off of that graphic that comes to mind when, you know, you see those flow charts and, you know, minimizing those errors or those margins, I should say. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Lily, what about you? Do you see anything in terms of the industry that maybe people are doing pretty regularly with generative design? You're getting a lot of questions about in, in terms of how generative design can help them in their daily workflows. We see uh, people doing kind of all kinds of different studies, um, which is one of the reasons why we took the approach of making solution that was built on a visual programming language, right? Which where you can program your own designs, right? Like that's the mm -hmm. critical, your, your design algorithms are the, are the critical thing. And we just provide the automation and the tracking of them. Um, but we, we see a lot of people really interested in doing, in, in terms of architecture, if people interested in doing space planning and doing massing, um, we are really interested in um, helping people do environmental analysis um, and doing, you know, early stage design analysis using these tools, we think are a lot of um, really good, good workflows. Um, but yeah, I mean, sky's the limit. And we, I, the Hogwarts examples of, <laughs> I love like, I mean, it just shows that you can do, you know, you can do so many different things with, with these tools. Can you tell anything about the uh, roadmap? Anything that you can share in terms of what we can see in the future for generative design? Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in like Sophia's um, presentation about being able to bring more people into the decision process by using data backed uh, designs that you've generated is really, really interesting to us. And we're really trying to on our like big roadmap is the idea of, you know, introducing automated design techniques for, you know, what they're good for. They're not good for everything, um, as you all know, but like some things they're very, very good for, you know, manipulating values a little bit and seeing how that changes and just identifying your goals and being able to include stakeholders in these decisions where you have data is really um, something that we are really interested in getting better and better about and being able to share data with more people, uh, we think is really interesting part of the roadmap. Um, and then, you know, the tools are new and uh, at least in, you know, Generative Design and Revit was just mm -hmm. launched in 2021. And, you know, Generative Design workflows have been around and this idea of doing automated design exploration like this has been around for decades, you know, but having the tools. Project to, Fractal, Refinery, right? A well, lot of the and, exploration even that Autodesk has done. Yeah. And generative artists, um, you know, have been doing this kind of thing for since the like 50s, 60s. Um, but uh, introducing, you know, making these tools really easy to get a hold of and use. We're really interested in um, having, you know, a large, um, a large audience and a large um, number of people who can put their ideas in how to use these tools. So looks like we have a few questions, um, maybe for you particularly. How much of the process are you showing to your clients versus using purely internally within the design team? A little bit confused by that, Sarah. So maybe, um, like, are we, when Autodesk is actually generating these generative design processes, how much are they actually sharing with the client versus just giving them a packaged... Um, oh, I'm sorry, less for Autodesk, more for the other speakers. Okay, so that's a that puts it better into perspective. Sophia and Alex, um, how would, much would you guys say um, would you share with this elaborate generative design process and the some of the you know Rhino and the computational different programs that you're using in terms of even just educating them on this basis? Or are you just kind of showing them the the end 
result and just saying, oh, look, look these are our optimized, you know, we're so smart, here's our result. <laughs> Uh, like from from in our presentation, I think we present a lot about the logic behind the algorithms rather than exactly how the nodes in Grasshopper are connected and these kind of things. And we've written a lot of code in C sharp, and we're not going to go like through all of that kind of details. Um, but in our presentation, we talk a lot about like the logic and how to translate. Um, architectural expertise into something that is understandable for a computer. Um, so it's more like that perspective in our presentation. Uh, at our firm, we, we're we doing a lot right now in terms of even, you know, whether it's computational design or just we have a data unit team that actually works hard to kind of crunch numbers. If it's not generative design, it's for something else. Generative design is still new to us, actually. but. I think the way, similar to what Sophia said, I, I think we, we really like to use Power BI when we can to really showcase an overall picture and to not dive in too deep to the process. Um, you know, if I think if people like to know more, it's always fun to bring people in it, when they want to engage more. But I think Power BI really is just something that enables us to connect and communicate really easily, easily to clients. And also the fact that it's very interactive allows us to talk through solutions or possible scenarios. So that's kind of where we are right now. We also use Power Apps as a way. Um, Jose Miguel at our firm has been is using Power Apps in a really interesting way where we're getting client input. Um, so we have sliders and things that are actually exporting then an Excel file, which you could imagine could be imported into directly into generative design. So there's so many unique ways that I think you can engage clients. Um, on the front end and on the back end to make it just like an easier conversation. Awesome. Well, we have another minute here. I do want to uh, launch this poll. We asked about your company and whether your company uses, um, let's see if I can get this going here. Doesn't want to let me. Looks like it's maybe frozen up on me. Am I sharing results somewhere? Do you guys see results somewhere? All right, well, before I do that, okay, got a sharing error. Before I do that, I do wanna share the presentation names up here again. Make sure that you guys are registered for AU if you are not already. Um, go ahead and ask you guys to register. Every, all of this information is also on the, um, LinkedIn website that I was referring to, the BIMXT Network LinkedIn website. So you can definitely find that. So this poll here is, have you ever used generative design? So we asked about your company in particular, but we're actually asking about you. And it looks like a good amount of people here have used it. So once again, we're kind of in that third, have played around with it. So that's fantastic. I'd love to hear from you guys in terms of what some of the things you guys are doing. Please connect with us on LinkedIn. We'd love to hear from you there. We will have to thank our AU presenters for sharing today and giving us a little snippet of their presenter presentation. So Alex Nelson, Eric and Sophia, Raquel Bascones and Lily Smith, thank you guys so much. Once again, to our, our participants, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Make sure you, you register for AU. Once again, it's free. Join the 75,000 others who have registered if you have not yet. So thank you guys all, and we'll see you next month.